Morning, mate. Morning, darling. How are you? Great. Right, where are you taking me today? I'm taking you to a faster headquarters because although we do meet your heroes, sometimes it's nice to do some of our own cars, surely. That's very true. And which one of the Mighty Fleet are we going to go and see? Out of the Mighty Fleet. Today we are doing the Yaris GR, but none other than the Tom's Yaris GR. I think we all like to think, don't we, that actually we're a little bit of a rally driver or a race driver. And when you buy one of those homologation cars, if you buy a Sierra Cosworth, if you buy a GR Yaris, there's a little bit of your brain, particularly if you're a boy, that makes you think, yeah, I'm like that guy I see on the TV, or <laughs> I have a, a smidgen of that talent. You don't, but you like to think that you do. You'd like to think that you do. But I mean, look at all the homologation specials. We've got Escort Cosworth, uh, Impreza, uh, obviously Tommy Mackinnon with the Evos. Um, what else have we got? Well, it's funny that you mentioned Tommy Mackinnon because Tommy Mackinnon actually and Tommy Mackinnon Racing actually had a hand in developing this car, didn't they? They actually did some of the yes. legwork on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, funnily enough, if you actually. Everyone bangs on about how the Yaris is a small car, but if you actually look at the Yaris in comparison to uh, an Evo 6 and you put it side by side, the Yaris makes the the 6 look tiny. Yeah, well, they're so really wide, wide, aren't they? Yeah. And also, if you look at the who's who of rallying, they had a hand in this car. So you've got Chris Meek, part of the development. You've got Yari Mati Latvala, part of the development team in this. So what I love with this car is they have just got the best people in rallying, the people that sort of wrote the legend. It says, right, lads, you are, you're our development team for this car. Yeah. To me, the person that I would like to tip my hat to as a petrol head is Akio Toyoda. I don't know what that guy is smoking, but I, I love him. I absolutely, I'd love to meet him and just shake him by the hand because he, in the kind of last stage of the petrol car that we're enjoying now, he has decided he's almost on a one-man mission just to make all this fun stuff, isn't he? So he made the Lexus LC Coupe. Yeah. He's done the GR Super at a time when nobody's really making sports cars. He's just done the GR86. He's done this, the GR Yaris. They're making it almost like the last hurrah of petrol powered sports it's cars. Definitely, but uh, they've just got their mojo back. Oh, big time. What a thing. See, I love the look of this. I like the look of the standard car anyway. I think it's remarkable. But this with the Tom's kit on, it's just, everything's an 11, isn't Ele it? Elevates it a little bit more. Yeah. It really does take, I think when we were looking at various kits for the car, um, there was like the Pandem kit and things like that, but we just decided it was probably The Mandem like the Pandem. Mm, yeah, but they, they would date really quickly, wouldn't they? But yet the Tom's is almost like a, a well, a supported, well, that's it. I think if you're doing anything like this, because these cars will be worth a lot of money one day, if you look at every other homologation car back in period, fast forward 25 years, they're all worth enormous amounts of money. I yeah. think if you kept this one the way it was for that period of time, if you had a TRD kit... TRD kitted, yeah, or Tom's, yeah. yeah. They're the ones I think people would accept as a modified car. Yeah. Some of these will get modified. The clever people will keep them standard because that'll be worth what's huge amounts of money at the end. But then when we look at numbers, so for yeah. them to homologate this car, there was 25,000 built. Yeah. So yes, they are kind of rare, but that was for the European and the Japanese market. They, they haven't gone to America or anywhere else like that. So there are quite a few cars. So modified. Not as rare as say a 22B. There was only 16 UK cars. Uh, the rest were Jap spec. Yeah, there's only 400 and odd of those as well, so that was a super rare car. Yeah, so if you had the one on the... So I, I think we were safe to, to modify it. But talking about rarity though, you think of this car, what I love about this is the purity of vision that they had. Every homologation car we've spoken about today, Escort Cosworth, Subaru Impreza, yeah. Delta Integrale, you name it, it's based on a showroom model, isn't it? At least the centre case, the body in white, is a production car. This car Where, is completely bespoke yeah. for this project. The only thing that carries over are the lights, the mirrors, the rear lights, and the sharp fin, and that's it. Yeah, um, and I think that's why so many people, when they, they knew about the car being released, that's why people were putting the names down. And that, yeah. So during 2020, I managed to find this car in February last year and bought it from a guy. 
he bought it from his friend and he said, I've got a three-year-old daughter, why have I bought this car? Yeah. It's completely, it's not the, the ideal thing. Um, so we bought it off him, but it had done 15 miles, I think it was. Yeah. So we we missed the waiting list, but I think we paid a little bit over, just a But smidge. people are, even now though, people are still paying three, four grand over the odds. Yeah, so there was supposed to be a base car, was supposed to be just under £30,000, and then obviously with the circuit pack, um, which gives you all the sexy diffs and all the yeah, extra bits. Yeah, the, the, the forged wheels, which obviously we're running Red Sports at the moment. Um, but yeah, so it would be about 32, 33, somewhere around there. Um, but so much car for the money. And, and there's people with McLarens, big stables of cars. Yeah. Um, and these things were just on a B road will annihilate anything. I love the air management on this. So obviously at the front, you've got all of this is channeling air through and down the sides of the car. On the standard bumper, you've got these flat surfaces, which again is controlling air. The intake on the front, not only is it feeding the air filter, it's doing the intercooler yeah. and the rad at the same time. That's very efficient. The roof's interesting, isn't it? It's 45 mil lower overall. So 45 mil at the front as a roof chop, if yeah. you like. The proportion is nicer than the standard Yaris. It's 95 mil at the back, it tapers away. And again, that's airflow. They're trying to get the car to cleave through the air. And the big thing really with this at the back was to give access for the air to go across the top of that standard spoiler so it actually performs a function. Yeah, obviously because it was built to be a, a WRC car, yeah. you need to have a big wing on the back. So the, the real drop off. But so This roof, so this is exciting isn't it, this roof, because you have made your roof naked. Because you've got forged carbon rather than woven carbon, which everyone is familiar yes, with. Yes, it is now naked, yes. It is a naked roof. And it's interesting, you can see why they wrap it, because obviously the thing about forged carbon, it's hard to get a perfect flat surface, particularly if you gloss lacquer it. Yeah, so predominantly where you'd normally see forged carbon would be in Lamborghinis. They were like one of the main people to start using, I suppose, especially uh, air vents and, yeah. you know, exterior parts. Because it's got that lovely, and I'd equate this, it's very like being in a kind of 80s, 90s bathroom in Tramps Nightclub. I like it. Where we met. <laughs> Prince Andrew wasn't there. And it's got that kind of black marble effect, isn't it? It's, I think it's very cool. I think this is better. And what's weird, isn't it, the fact that they actually wrap this real forged carbon with a fake carbon wrap. Yes, so because the forged carbon is probably not as a perfect finish, yeah. they then wrap it with a fake carbon. Everyone's just like... Yeah. So there's fake carbon on real carbon, but it's not woven, it's forged. But is that, do you think, the only case in car history where a manufacturer has wrapped really expensive forged carbon why, with but, fake carbon? So we, we obviously took the wrap off. Yeah. It was obviously polished up and then it's been lacquered. But it also shows you the airflow, shows you the creases in the roof. Yeah. Because you're talking about the weight saving, carbon roof, but then you've got alloy bonnet, alloy doors, yeah. alloy boot lid. And I know it's a completely different car, but do you know when I think of a car that when someone last did that with a 1600, Lupo GTI. Yeah. Little 1.6, non-turbo, four pot, not three. Yeah. Um, non-turbo, but 120 brake. Obviously, doesn't that show you how amazing the output of this is? Because this is, again, same displacement. Yeah, but that was 20 years ago. That was 2001, yeah, this I think. is 360 newton meters of torque, isn't it? 257 yeah. brake before you tune it. That's a mind-blowing figure from a three-pot engine, isn't it? And at the back, where you've got those lights, this is, I think, the most distinctive part of this car. Do you remember in the old days, if you used to follow a Testarossa, there was nothing like the rear view of a Testarossa, was there? Yeah. It was just width, six foot of width. This is almost the same. This thing is so wide at the back, isn't Cars it? Cars have gone so bland over the years, haven't they? Yeah. You no, know, everything's just like curved and blah. And we've lost all that, almost that 80s, 90s boxiness. Yeah. You know, look at Vauxhall Novas, you look at Delta Integrales, all that kind of stuff. You had big, haunchy, and this is where we're back to. It's brought it back, is not it? Yeah, but it was so well done. You know, they got it so right. The, the rear bumper, um, obviously accentuated by the Tom's rear diffuser, because as part of the Tom's kit, it's the same bumper, but it takes away from being the dual exhaust to the singular, but it just helps accentuate. Somehow it just makes it look so much wider. Yeah. So it's very cool on the outside. I think the inside is also worthy of comment. And you've made a, quite a few changes in here, haven't you? It's a little bit different to the, the standard cars, yeah. So our interior is a little bit more different to... Well, it is because all the road reports, I haven't spent enough time in a standard car to really judge. Uh, people say that the standard seats sit too high. I've sat in one, I've done 15, 20 miles in Richard from ITG's car. You do have a freaky body, though. I have got a very short body and very long legs. Mm. So to me, the standard seats are actually OK, but a lot of people say if you're taller, they sit too high. So you've obviously done the bride seat upgrade. 
and they're sitting much lower in the chassis. So. Well, what we did was we actually chopped out, they've got like little three inch turrets. Yeah. And we chopped those all out. So we're, we're actually sat a lot lower. Um, we've got some different um, mounts coming to lift them slightly because we've kind of gone from being low. way too high <laughs> to way too low. And then so we need to find that little half. Because this is between. a very touring car, uh, you know, competition car seating position now, very low, very far back. Yeah, they, they are on rails, so they're not fixed. Um, the original seats did have a, a, a pump rake, so you could obviously lift it high and low, but even on the lowest setting, yeah. um, you were very restricted as to, especially taller people, but there was, it was done because of rallying in mind, once again, you know, the higher suspension. Type. Yeah, it's interesting. And there's a few other tricks in here as well. So you've got a gear lever that actually sits 50 mil higher than the standard car. Again, it's just to give you that more kind of sequential position, isn't it? Higher up near the steering wheel. Yeah, because instead of being traditionally low, I mean, if you think about one of the car companies that really did raise the steering wheel high was the EP3 Civic Type R, yeah. you know, on the dash. Wicked um, shift position, that, isn't it? Oh, it's a brilliant, yeah, such a good position. And if you do actually look at that, it is noticeably higher when you actually look from the steering wheel across, you know, it is... But it's higher than the bottom of the wheel, isn't it? Yeah, so it is, it's there. Um, yeah, so it's a really good focused driving position, but it's just it was just the seating. It wasn't quite good enough for road use. It well, obviously, on. you've lost the rear seat with this cage, which is very cool. But again, if you've got the standard car, what I think is really clever about this, and they did it with the GT86, is that you can fold the back seat down and it will take four of the standard wheels and tyres, so yeah. you can go to a track with your spares, fling around all day, go down to the cords, put your standard ones back on and drive home. And I just think that's such a nice detail that they've really thought about who the end audience is, who's going to use it and how they're going to use it. Yeah, so many people are using these on track. I mean, you have three modes for the differentials. You've obviously got normal driving, you've got sport, and then you've got track. So it, it splits it from 50-50 to 60-40 and 70-30 split with the, with the torque. One of the most subtle mods that we've done, obviously the Pride Lomax seats, it's car to harnesses. Um, Fits the look of the car, doesn't it? Particularly it does, the it's very JDM. On. Now that side, for anybody looking and, and wondering why, we've got the driver's seat that side rather than the passenger, it's because day-to-day -day use, it was really not good. Yeah, as when you get a winged seat for getting out of junctions isn't always that clever. No, it? so that's why, uh, so when we go to track, it's obviously bolt out, swap over. Yeah. But it's also great if you're the passenger and you want to have a snooze because it's the perfect height. <laughs> you put a cushion yeah, in there. Yeah. You don't need a cushion, you just go. <laughs> so when we took it to Ireland uh, for one of the rallies, yeah, people just used it as the snooze car. Love it. Right. All competition cars, as Colin Chapman famously said, it's all about adding likeness, isn't it? And they really have managed the weight on this car. It's very impressive how they've done it. Tried and tested stuff, so you've got Aluminium bonnet, aluminium doors, aluminium boot. There's 24 kilos there, believe it or not, just in those panels. And then a little bit more weight saving with the roof. Yeah, carbon roof, that's another three and a half kilos as well. I mean, this car manages 200 brake horsepower per tonne, which for a little 1.6. Yeah. The shower itself is... And, and you're yet to drive it. I know, well, that obviously adds the weight quite significantly. But the whole car is 1,280 <laughs> kilos, which is... Yeah, for a modern car, it's not a light car, is it, 1,280, but... For a modern car, that is not a big number anymore. It's not. It? It's not Colin Chapman like, but no. no. But look, look what's within the car. You have a four-wheel drive system, which obviously adds a lot of weight to it. Um, you've got, I mean, this particular the, the chassis for these was made up of the Yaris at the front, wasn't it, and yeah. the roller at the back. So it was kind of joined to the two platforms to get the four-wheel drive system. And it's very clever, isn't it? Because the whole thing, the body and white on this car, is 38 kilos lighter than the previous Yaris. And you think in an age where cars generally get heavier and heavier with each yeah. iteration. This is one car that's going backwards. Yeah, but then we obviously we have to keep stemming back to the fact that it was designed to be a rally car. Yeah. So everything that within it was for a purpose. Lightweight with the pillarless doors. Yeah. But you know why they've done that? I love this design feature because it's not only for lightweight, which of course you save a tiny bit of weight yeah. by not having frames on the doors, but the main reason they did it, you get a better glass seal at speed. That's it. So they're saying if the car's going absolutely flat chat, because I just thought because it looked cooler. Well, that's a very JDM thing, isn't it? Yeah. Famous doors. Because I had GC8 Impress, I still have one. To me, that when you open the door and it's famous doors. That was one of the coolest things about the Impress. That I think that's one of the things people really picked up on. Yeah. You'd have like the little um, rake at the back on the back door, wouldn't you? But then it would just kind of come out. Do you know what I like though? Frameless doors. If you're a larger gentleman like myself and you park in a garage or next to another car, what's really good with frameless doors, if you have a total closure alarm is you can get out of a really tiny space 
which you can't do with a frame door, without banging your door, then clip it and it puts the window up. Do you not do that one? It's just such it's because you're so slim. Such a fountain of knowledge. Yeah. Just that's my uh, top life hack. So the standard wheels are very light. Yeah, if you get the circuit pack, which this car is, so the circuit pack has obviously the different differentials and the bigger brakes, but they also come with BBS forged wheels. Yeah. Now those. Wheels how much are, are those BBS four wheels? Because one of my friends curbed there so badly they had to replace it, and I know they're an awful lot of money. If you go to Toyota and you want to replace an individual wheel, though, I think the retail's over a thousand pound each per wheel. So um, Take it, make sure you got lucky wheel nuts if you've got one of these. Yeah. So we've we've gone really JDM spec with the car. Yo, yo, JDM yo. So yeah. we have gone with the Wed Sports. Yeah. Uh, they look very cool. Set up that String Theory garage did for us, and we're running Nankang AR1 tyres. But um, yeah, I don't think this car, it wouldn't ever look right back on the standard forged wheels. Not so. with this big kit. This is funny, because no, obviously all. it's all about saving weight this car, isn't it? And you've put a little bit more weight back on there. But don't worry, because Toyota have you covered, because at the back, this back bumper, they've done with a very clever moulding technique. And this is 38% lighter than the standard bumper. You can actually feel it if you press you can, it. Yeah, you can actually it's give so it a thin, squeeze, isn't yeah. it? You can actually hear it. It's, there's nothing to it, is there? And I love this car, it's just all about singularity of purpose, all about going fast, saving weight. And whatever they can shave a pound off, they've done it, haven't they? Yeah. And then you put loads more weight back on. But it does look cool. It does look cool. Yeah. Pop the hood, Johnny. I'll let you do it. Well, because I know where it is. Yeah, and you're a professional. Look at that. Oh, I even though you wear the stain on it. Beautiful. Yeah. Should talk about this, this is a very clever bit of engineering and I love the fact with this, because there were no three cylinder regs for World Rally Car, Toyota had to go cap in hand to the MSA and say, can we have please dispensation to build a three cylinder engine? But there's so much character from a three cylinder. I think so. Don't you reckon, because I would rather have a really peppy three cylinder than a four cylinder, because four cylinders just sound pretty flat and boring because yeah. they almost reciprocate, don't they? Three cylinders, sounds a bit obvious, but do literally sound like half a six, don't they? Yes, they do. What was it, the little course they did in the 90s, were they a one Ecotech, litre, yeah. one litre, three cylinder, 12 valve or whatever, weren't they? Because they had like that, they almost have like their own little rasp yeah. to them, Yeah, a bit they? like an old two stroke, you know, like a Saab two stroke. Oh my God, here we go. <laughs> they do, they sound like that. bloody Saabs. But I just think they, they've got something cool, and of course this makes the numbers as well, this is 257 horsepower, 360 newton metres of torque, so it's quick, that's before you tune it, and we'll talk about this, Sexy ITG in a minute. But then you've got 143 miles an hour, 0 to 16, five and a half seconds. That's a fast car. Yeah. It will quite, uh, um, on uh, a circuit, fifth gear, 120 miles an hour. You don't even have to really go into six. It's, it, there's still range there in yeah. fifth gear at like 120. When we got the car brand new, we pretty much went down to racing line within the first few weeks of having it. And we put it on their dyno, which is super accurate because yeah. they're constantly developing parts. It was, it's one of the most expensive and accurate dynos you'll ever go on. And I think we Not got... Not according to Gary on the internet. Gary on the internet says his mate's dyno is... is yeah. The one. Yeah, that's the one. The, and his yeah. car's got 500 horsepower, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Pop and bang map. Stage oh, yeah, definitely, two on a Fiesta. Yeah. yeah, that kind. Um, and I think uh, the car standard made 261. Which is pretty much what they say. Yeah, okay, so really? 257, I'm, you know, I'm, it's not like the Toyota Supras, for example, which the Mark Fives, where yeah. they were supposed to be... Hugely underrated. Massively. By the factory. Yeah, like there's obviously videos out there where the, the Supra and the Z4, which are not the same car. But also, if you don't know, there was this thing in the 1990s where Japanese manufacturers had what they called a gentleman's agreement, where everybody agreed that all their cars should be 280 horsepower. Hardly any of them were. Loads of the cars, like the Supra of the 90s, were over 300. Yeah. Nissan 300 ZX, hardly any of them were 280. They were all 300 no. or something. But it was just considered to be a gentlemanly figure. None of them were. Yeah. So the people who make the Z4 Supra comparison jokes are the same people who do the MR2 Ferrari jokes, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, it's very true, actually. Yeah. Very true. But you've so, done a few mods, you've got this rather lovely strut brace going across. Yeah, so Josh from JP Cages, um, we developed, which we'll move on to, we developed the uh, GTS style cage. So you know the BMW E92 GTSs? Yeah. Um, they had like a double cage inside yeah. them. So we did 
uh, we've done that with um, a rear brace as well, and then we just did that little. And can you feel the difference when you're driving? Can you feel? Has it increased the rigidity? <clears> you of the can't. Car? You can't feel it on road. Yeah. Not at all, um, because you're not putting the car under enough stress. And if you are doing, you particularly the way you drive. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so the ITG Rich came and fitted this morning. Actually, this morning he fitted he it this very very morning. This is interesting because this is a car yet that not many people, not many ECU unlockers. I've managed to tap this car yet because everyone that's been tuning these has been doing them on tuning boxes and that's unusual because most mappers will try and go for a full ECU crack won't they and remap it properly yeah there are but it's only just starting to happen isn't it there are a couple out there and we we've got some um things that we're working on or looking to do in the future one of them's hybrid turbo and bits and bobs so you can there are people out there running comfortably towards a 400 brake horsepower now. this is nice this is itg as we said, Rich put this on this morning. This is very, very similar to their Toker filters, their touring car filters. So this is a maxogen inside an enclosure. What's yeah. lovely about this is normally if you put an induction kit in an engine, it just gets a load of heat soak. This sits in an aluminium enclosure. And so it's only drawing the air from the front. So obviously it's getting mainly cold air through the front here, straight into the front there, straight through. And they are seeing a greater airflow on this. And I think when people can actually start to properly map these cars using sophisticated ECUs, I think this will really come into its own. Yeah. I'm excited to see what that will do. Well, yeah, because th this has just been fitted. So I've not even driven the car yet, but just- It sounds better already. It sounds it? better already. Cause it's yeah. like, I remember bolting on so many air filters as a, a, a younger man. And Long just like away. straight away, my father came out, oh, I had an over SRI and I put one on that <laughs> and was like, Jonathan, what were you doing? But well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to say something now. I'm going to make an admission now. I would put an induction kit on, even if I lost one horsepower. Oh, yes, horsepower. definitely. I yeah. would keep it on just because the noise is so much better. The induction noise, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so even if it was no benefit at all, just for the look and the sound, I'd leave it on. Yeah. One of, one of the reasons why the batteries in the back of the car was to obviously create more space in the engine bay for things like the air filter as well. It is, and they've been very clever. They've got very thin water jacket, very thin cylinder walls on this as well. So they've really kind of run everything right to the end. I've had a few people I know have already had these apart to have a look at them. And they're saying the engineering on this, it's like a motorbike engine, basically. That's the tolerances and the way they've put them together. It's, it's not car levels of engineering. It's much more like a race bike engine. There's a few very trick bits though. So this has got a ball bearing turbo, which again, is something a lot of tuners would put on, but to get that from the factory, my only criticism of this power plant, which I adore, I love everything about it, I love the fact it's three cylinders, I love the sound of it, I love the power it makes, I love the way it drives. My only criticism of this entire car is why do they pump the noise to the stereo? Because that's a cheat. Uh, do you know something? You know like in a Gold Fire where they pump it through, it's yeah. really, uh, it's, it's almost obvious that it's pumped through. Yeah. In this, it's not so bad. Really? I don't think... I get that because I took the GR Super to the Nürburgring when I had it on, you can hear it coming through the speakers and you know it's fake noise. This doesn't, do, this doesn't sound like it's fake. If anything, the really? stereo in this car is awful. Everything about this engine is very clever, isn't it? It's next level, it's a competition-derived engine. It's not what you'd expect in a hatchback. So Yaris is the badge, but this isn't a Yaris, is it? No. This is something very special. I think when these cars become collector's cars in years to come, and let's be honest, they almost already are, and still fetching a premium, I think it's the engineering it's going to make people very excited. And so when we were talking about the actual uh, construction of the car and about how unique it is, and it is a ground up thing, the actual, the, the front half of the car is Yaris. Yeah. And the rear is the new Corolla. Yeah. So it's actually a, a, a joint of two platforms. It's not an existing platform that they've just gone, oh, okay, well, we'll just put a four wheel drive system into it. It's completely unique. But that's the incredible thing, because normally the car like this, you'd expect something to be carried over it, and there's a little bit of chassis architecture, but there's not a lot. Yeah, this is this so engine minimal. I know, but the gearbox, the differentials, the engine, the body shell is all bespoke to this car. And I can't really think of another car in recent memory where a manufacturer's done that. And they must lose so much money on every single one of these cars. And I just they applaud do, the fact they that they do with having to make 25,000 of them. But yeah. I, I, I kid you not, in easily over 10 odd years, it's the, the best car, that the new car that I've driven. But that's the genius it's, of this highly, whole project, isn't it? The because, car is highly addictive. Yeah. It's, it's such a good all-rounder. I think the only depressing thing about the car is the fact that you get only 20-something to the gallon from a little 1.6. And even if you tend to nurse it, so it just needs to be kind of thrashed everywhere. It's true. But whatever money they're losing on each one, I think it's money well spent. Because can you think recently of a time where you'd say, you know, the car I want more than anything else in the world is a Toyota Yaris? 
And it's made a lot of very, very discerning car collectors and enthusiasts say, the car I would really like to own is a Toyota Yaris. So I think for that reason in the lane, marketing genius, even if it's costing them... Do you know what they should bring back, thinking about it? Wow. Because if you put this on a back road, so I've driven with uh, some of the lads when we've done like day rallies. So yeah. Ferrari F12 and McLaren 650S behind me, I left them. Yeah. So they should bring back that 80s, 90s marketing thing with the car in front is a Toyota. Yeah, they should. Solid doors with side impact bars enclose you in a haven of high tensile steel. The car in front is a Toyota, the new Carina E. Tom's, I think, is a name that's going to be very familiar to anyone who's a Toyota enthusiast. I think it's fair to say, if you want one, you need to have fairly deep pockets, don't you? You just stress me out pressing on the aluminium bonnet like Yes, that. I know. Honestly, that's not good. Just never do that, children. Always let it drop. Don't do it like Johnny does. <laughs> so the Tom's kit, so it's a lovely full front bumper, which costs an enormous... Amount of money. A huge amount of money. You've yeah. then got the sexy side skirts as well. You've upgraded the wheels, it's got Olin's dampers on. You've got the Tom's yes. rear exhaust and balance as well. So if I was to go out and buy that for my Yaris, how much pocket money would I save up? It's, it's quite a lot of money. The Tom's kit is in the region of about £10,000 plus uh, painting and fitment. Yeah, um, I mean, it looks brilliant, but crikey, for 10 grand. It does, really but and as I say, it does enhance the value because it is a proper, it's not like a, a bolt-on Halfords kit. It's yeah. a proper uh, kit with heritage assigned to Toyota. So you get the complete front rear bumper, uh, front bumper. And I have to say, I mean, it fits beautifully, doesn't it? It fits like an OEM part, that's the thing. Yeah, it's essentially, because they work alongside them. So it, it has to be, you can't command that kind of money if the, if the fitment's awful, can you? So we've got the front bumper in terms of the Tom's kit. You've got the side skirts, yeah. the rear spoiler, and then you've got the rear lower valance on the rear bumper, which takes it from the Twin exhaust to the central. It looks very cool. And you've got these Olin's dampers as well. Yes, you've got Olin's, which are JDM specs, so they're, they're a, a stiffer spring rate, if yeah. you like. They're not How does that manage on a UK road? Because I've had JDM dampers before and they're almost too stiff. Are these okay? Yes, yeah, it's, it's fine. Uh, absolutely fine. So you know, I'm nearly got... 50 now, so these things matter. You, well, you're going to find out in a minute. Well, shall we take it for a drive? It's great to talk about it here in the studio, but shall we take it out? Yes. Come on then. Shall I drive? Yeah, you can well, so you take it out, then I'll drive. Okay, all right. Watch me disappear. <laughs> <laughs> I'll open the door. Hi. Right, it is time to try out GR Yaris. Makes such a good noise, doesn't it? I would put an induction kit on absolutely every single car on the planet. It's actually really transformed the engine noise. I mean, even if you put an induction kit on a a Nova SRI or a Mark, it just induction kits make everything, forced induction makes everything sound better. It does. You can hear how sticky those tyres are, they're literally flinging every little bit of gravel and salt into the arch. You can hear it, Don't can't say you? salt. It's got salt, it's, it's the worst day. This is doing my OCD head in because we are driving this beautiful car, just being cleaned as well, in the middle of winter on semi slicks, in the salt. <laughs> it just makes me want to cry. It really does. My initial impressions are that straight away the Olins work really, really well. It's still really compliant. But anyone you've got up to a, a larger wheel here, you've got a very stiff wall tyre. It still drives really nicely. You haven't spoiled the character of the car because I've driven a few standard ones of these and they are just epic. It's one of those cars you don't want to spoil the balance. You don't want to go too far with them because they're so good out of the box, aren't they? They're so good off the showroom floor. I think if you do too much of suspension and wheels and tyres, you can actually spoil the balance. Yeah, bear in mind, these are JDM spec Olins, um, but they're not harsh, are they? No, I'm surprised because they're stiff and the car feels very, very responsive, very positive, but it's not actually too shaky, too bumpy. And it's actually really nice. I'd love to take this on track. What I love about this car, it's very short, isn't it? So when you're making direction changes, it responds so it's quickly. It's ridiculous. I actually did have someone pull out in front of me not long ago um, and I had to change direction really quickly um, actually not far from where we are now and um, yeah it just the, the car was not unsettled from anyone looking it would have looked incredible maneuver like I was the best but it was probably down well, obviously to the... you're a bit of a wheel man Johnny we know that so I mean you guys have gone all in on this because when what does this owe you now let's let's be honest they're not an inexpensive car they're very good value right. when you buy them standard of course there's no discounts at the moment on any of these if you can find one and then you've probably put thick end of what another 20 on top yeah and a, yeah a bit more 
on top. But everything, I suppose even if you look at all our race cars and everything like that, the, the whole idea of Faster is that it is a premium brand and everything that we do is to the highest level. And um, This is definitely the nicest hoodie I've ever had, I'd just like to point that out. Let's go, let's go. So out of a junction, put your foot down. <laughs> the noise! <laughs> it's induction noise as well. You should hear it from outside the car. Does it sound good? It sounds really good, yeah. But do you know what you want? Because we are probably, let's be honest, facing the tail end of the petrol motor car, which I think is a great, great shame, but I understand the reasons why, but I think if you are going to invest in inverted commas in a new car, which is probably going to lose money, you might as well have one of these if you can get one, because it's just comical, isn't it? The whole car is designed to entertain. You could use it every day because it's a Toyota at the end of the day. It's got a reasonable boot, it's got four seats if you haven't got this one, but... It's ridiculously entertaining, and I would challenge anybody on any terrain other than a straight line drag race over two miles. In whatever they're in, whether it's six figures, seven figures, doesn't matter. I think this car would absolutely decimate anything between two points on the map. And it does, because I've been there. F12, McLaren 650S, back roads through the Lincolnshire Walls, just... Yeah. But they, don't you think that's an incredible engineering feat, though, to be able to get a car that is relatively affordable. What are they, like 350 quid a month or something? Yeah, I think when Toyota were doing them, they were um, small deposits uh, with the option to purchase a PCP with a balloon on, and they were about 300 quid a month. Well, 300 quid a month, so you know, that's, it's, it's not it's a small amount of money, no. but it's, it's within the reach of a lot of average enthusiasts. And you can then put yourself behind the wheel of something that on any given day, pick a car in the canon of automotive awesomeness, and you can beat it within the legal speed limit on any country road you care to mention and it's easy to make a car brilliant for 1.2 million isn't it but it's not easy to make a car that brilliant for 34 grand no and i ask you is there a hot hatch that you'd rather have than this i'd rather have this than a golf r yeah i'd rather have it over a, a fiesta st um i find a lot of those cars especially oh god everyone's gonna hate me for this i find golf r's really blunt to drive um but they are, they're just, I, I, they're I too do, clinical, aren't they? Yeah, my wife's got a T-Roc car, which is a Golf R, essentially, but with a bigger body on, but they're just, they're a bit soulless. And they, yeah, they, they're quick, point to point, but not as quick as one of, of these. And what this has and to be... And the new Golf R, by the way, yeah. on the Mark 8, spec'd up, it's like 60,000 quid. Well, that's the thing, it's a lot of money. The it's RS3's are 80,000 spec'd up now. And that isn't an enthusiast level car, is it? That no, is, that's 80 insane. grand is not. If you're in your 20s, you're not going to be able to afford to buy it. Bear, bearing in mind, comparison, so £60,000 for a new Mark A Golf R, which is 300 odd brake, you can go buy a 996 Turbo. Yeah. Or with the next 50 pack, which was a, a, a factory upgrade, by the way, um, and 50, 60 grand, a manual 911 Turbo. Okay, running costs are different and not necessarily day to day, but I would just downshift all day in this car. But this to me is the purity of what a hot hatch is. It's the modern day take on a hot hatch, because of course they all used to be normally aspirated front wheel drive. A modern hot hatch is clearly turbocharged four wheel drive, but it's still got that tenacity, it's still got that sort of get up and go and that visceral feel where everything comes back to the driver. And more importantly, when you drive this car, it's fun, it makes you smile. It makes you feel very involved with the drive, and a lot of cars these days, to me, feel clinical and removed. Yeah. This, I really feel like I'm wearing this car. And this reminds me of a lot of earlier hot hatches in its character. And I think, you know, it's the greatest compliment I can pay to this car. They've made this car feel very old fashioned in all the right ways. So I think my advice on this would be, I think this is one of the great investment cars. If you keep one short term, if you had one for a year, I don't think you'd lose a lot of money or at the moment, any money and I think if you keep one long enough like every other homologation car yeah the, the residuals on the cars in the first year uh, 18 months have been really really good really so I kind think, to people. yeah if you can afford one and you can manage the finance payment I would get one I think it's one of those cars that you'll always keep yourself for not only and while they're relatively affordable and relatively available if you enjoyed this video and particularly with the more dynamic content of us driving if there's any car that you would like to see us do please put that in the comments or email us or DM us on any of our social media platforms Please like and subscribe, ring that bell for the notifications, and thanks for watching.